Well, everybody, I uh, thank you for joining us on a uh, on a busy afternoon in the middle of your work week. I appreciate that very much. Uh, my name is Dr. John Graham, and I am coming to you from Salt Lake City, Utah. If there are any problems with the audio, uh, please uh, raise your hand, and uh, one of our moderators will uh, adjust and uh, and help along the way. We're going to save a few minutes at the end uh, for questions in the chat. And so I'm going to just start uh, giving you a little bit of my, a few of my thoughts about the importance of the same day start. Uh, in order to do that, before I start, I wanted to uh, make sure that everybody was aware that, uh, let me make sure I've got this, uh, that I am an initial investor in OrthoFi for full disclosure uh, and have used it uh, since its inception. Um, my office is is uh, a little bit different than than the, some of some of the offices that you're familiar with, and I wanted to give you just a little bit of a background uh, uh, sketch of my history, uh, so that you know where I'm coming from and why I am where I am here. So I was in uh, private practice uh, in Phoenix, Arizona, and. Uh, let me just do one thing here. I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna escape out of here for a second and get rid of this. Sorry about that, everybody. Now we're back. Okay, let me do this. Okay, so uh, in 2004, I purchased a practice uh, in Phoenix and uh, worked uh, four days a week uh, in that practice and opened up a satellite. Uh, that was about 25 minutes west of uh, my, my location. And uh, it was a very busy, busy practice. Uh, I was a single practitioner. Um, on the busiest day, I was a, we topped out at around 130 patients. Way, way, way too many patients for a single doctor to see comfortably. I didn't like it. I didn't get to know any of my patients. Uh, it was just not optimal for me. I wasn't, wasn't happy. Uh, in 2011, uh, my whole family and I moved to where we are now, Salt Lake City, Utah, from Phoenix. And uh, that was at the age of 45 for me and started all over again from scratch. Uh, and uh, did that just because of the fact that uh, we wanted to love where we lived and we didn't so much in Phoenix. Uh, but I needed to pay the bills. And so I um, maintained my Phoenix practice for three years. And what that would entail would be uh, me flying down to Phoenix three weeks a month. I would fly in early on a Monday morning and I would stay uh, in Phoenix for three nights and then fly back once a month as my new practice was growing but not big enough to have a full-time staff, I would fly my entire Phoenix staff up to Salt Lake, put them in a hotel, feed them, and then we'd work all day on a Friday, and then I'd fly them back down. And I did that for three years. And uh, it was a lot of uh, effort, but it was worth it because uh, ultimately I was able to sell that practice in Phoenix. And um, one of the key points about discussing why uh, I think that it's so important to exercise the benefits of OrthoFi in, in Same Day Starts is that uh, I never have hired a financial coordinator since I've been in Salt Lake. I had one in Phoenix, uh, but I have not had one here, uh, and I have been here uh, since 2011. I work three days a week, uh, generally speaking, and uh, I average now about 65 patients a day, which is about as much as I want to see uh, in a single day. Um, so why is it that I think that same day starts are so important? Well, part of it is because of the advantage of uh, the data that we are able to glean from practices across the country that are using OrthoFi and the numbers uh, scream to us uh, about the advantage of having somebody start the day that they're in the office. Uh, but I'll tell you that those, uh, the, the cards are stacked in our favor and also in the favor of the patient uh, 
uh, as far as starting on the day that they come in for the consultation. One of the things that I've always thought is to our advantage is that the, the uniqueness of the dental deformity, um, meaning that, you know, if you're missing an arm, uh, nobody, nobody looks down on you and nobody uh, judges you for having a missing arm. Uh, apologies to any arm missing folks out there, missing arm folks. Uh, you know, you might take pity on an individual, but you certainly don't, don't judge them and look down on them. But I'll tell you, in our society, that, that is the case with any dental deformity. You can be dressed to the nines and driving a very nice car, but if you smile and you've got giant gaps between your teeth, instantly the, the first reaction is, what, what's wrong with that guy? Uh, you know, is he not all there or you know what I mean? So I think that uh, unfortunately uh, in our society, but fortunately for orthodontists, that, that's a good thing for us. It, it is a rite of passage. Now it's becoming a rite of passage for adults. Uh, a shout out to Smile Direct Club, and I'm being real honest in, when I say this, that, uh, listen, I, I think that we've got nothing but benefit headed our way from Smile Direct Club elevating the conversation in the American, uh, uh, you know, mind uh, about the fact that orthodontics is readily accessible. Um, if they're in your office, then they've either not chosen to participate in Smile Direct Club or um, they don't like Smile Direct Club. And I think most orthodontists, when I say you, that I'm referring back to Smile Direct Club, uh, I think there's probably most people on this call tonight that have had patients that have had an experience where they um, now have a bilateral posterior open bite or whatever the case may be. Um, but it's interesting that I think a lot of individuals do see the inherent advantage of having a doctor involved uh, in the case more than just for the very first look. Uh, nearly every patient that walks in your office understands the cost of orthodontics. Nobody comes in thinking that it's going to be 200 bucks. And so that's an advantage for all of us. Uh, and so they're not shocked uh, by the price, but they're also not really stunned to hear that insurance does not pay a lot. Um, and, you know, I tell most patients that uh, it's probably going to be another three to five years where there is no such thing as an orthodontic benefit associated with, uh, with insurance because they're, they're doing everything they can not to pay, that's for sure. The uh, title of the presentation, The Five Irrefutable Principles of Selling, uh, actually is an article that comes from Entrepreneur Magazine. And uh, it, uh, it really does crystallize, in my mind, those things that are key to our uh, success as far as selling our services. Consumers only buy products and services that benefit them. Uh, value comes with a price tag. Credibility is dependent on two factors, trust and expertise, and the most valuable gift that you have to offer is yourself, meaning uh, authenticity. Uh, and then it is a give and give relationship. Those, as far as the, the, those that are successful at selling, and we'll talk about some of those. When we talk about value comes with a price tag and that consumers are only searching for things that really benefit them, that sounds obvious. But when we offer patients the power of having choice, then it really changes the calculus when discussing finances. Uh, this is just a, a screenshot of the current slider. Uh, it's interesting, and we will touch on it in a little bit, that OrthoFi is really uh, sort of known nationwide as the, as the slider, uh, and many companies uh, have copied that. Uh, but but the truth is that's the probably the one of the smallest parts of the services Orthofi provides. But what it has done is it has given us a real insight into the buying habits of of individuals, and it is really shocking sometimes to have somebody come in that you know has um, plenty of money, uh, that they are well to do and you give them the opportunity to choose their payment plan and they take the slider on the monthly payment and they drag it all the way down to the lowest uh, possible monthly payment, which includes interest, by the way. As you can see, the interest charge uh, uh, 
portion of the slider there. Um, we actually have always thought in orthodontics, nobody would ever pay interest if you finance in-house. And that's just not true. We've got quite a few patients that pay interest and OrthoFi splits that 50-50 with the practice. But the interesting thing is just observing the, uh, the, the, the nature of decision making when it comes to finances and how these patients are, are making these decisions. Here is the, the most, one of the most important data sets that we've been able to glean from OrthoFi. Um, and the, the thousands of patients that OrthoFi has started. Um, if you look at the, at, the, at the scatter chart that we have here, you can see down payment is along the x-axis and the y-axis is monthly payment. Um, you can see where the cluster is. A typical plan cluster uh, is, is sort of in that lower left area and then there's some outliers. Um, but it isn't the case that everybody will automatically choose lowest payment down uh, and, and also the, uh, the monthly payment. Uh, you can see where most of those typical plans fall. 22% of the average across all practices pay in full of patients pay in full. Um, SDC stands for uh, a same day contract. You'll hear me refer to it as a same day start SDS, but as when you see it here, I, it's just a same day contract is, uh, is the average uh, cost. Um, and uh, the down payment average is $834 with a 21 month average treatment plan. Um, the power of choice has changed the paradigm as far as the way we perceive consumers. And uh, I think that many, many people uh, in orthodontics today, especially my age and older, um, are very aware of the gurus that uh, were uh, teaching us about how to charge and how to identify patients. And the most popular one would categorize patients as A, B, and C patients based upon credit worthiness and things like that. And the reality is, while that may have been applicable 20 years ago, today it has no bearing on the spending habits or the dependability of patients in paying for their, for their cases. And, and that is just a function of a debt uh, dependent society. People are used to paying in payments uh, for almost every large purchase that they make, it's not unusual for them. And so they budget that in just like they would for, uh, you know, paying for, for a vehicle. Um, one of the things that I think is critical and it impacted me and I wanna share it with you is uh, especially, and the reason it impacted me uh, is that I came to Salt Lake City, nobody knew who I was. I was 45 years old. I had no history of practice in the valley, which we refer to, uh, refer to it as the valley. Some orthodontists knew who I was, but no consumers, no patients knew who I was. <clears throat> and the credibility is really dependent on trust and expertise. So how do you, how do you establish that? And this is, this is the same for an older doc like me or for somebody who's fresh out of residency. Uh, trust and expertise. You've got to establish those. The way that I decided to establish trust and expertise in my practice, and it worked well for me, uh, were the following. Uh, as far as expertise goes, I wrote a book. Remember I told you that I was flying down to Phoenix uh, three weeks a month. And so I had a lot of free time on my hands. And so those nights in the hotel room when I, my family was in Salt Lake, I was writing a book. I published it by myself through Amazon. The process couldn't be easier. Um, and I had uh, editors, I ran three rounds of editing and uh, the, the, I actually made it to number one on the bestseller list on, on Amazon uh, in orthodontics. I wanna make that clear, but I got a screenshot of it uh, for the moment that I made it number one. Uh, and, and then of course it fell after that, but nonetheless, I can say I'm a number one best-selling author. Um, however, the reason that a book is important, and I would encourage anybody to do this, it's not difficult to write a book, it's just a matter of doing it. And, and today you can just speak it and have somebody um, 
and there's a lot of ways to do this, but you don't even have to type it out. You can dictate it and then have it all written out for you. So, I mean, the, the, the effort compared to what it used to be is, is minimal, but uh, it instantaneously establishes authority in the minds of patients uh, just because of the fact that you're an author and that is sort of rarefied error. There are not a lot of authors around and those that write on a particular topic are deemed uh, at least in the minds of most individuals as being somewhat of an authority on that subject. So I wrote a consumer facing book called The Truth About Orthodontics and I just talk about my philosophy and actually it's worked great because I give it away at every uh, consultation and I don't have to spend as much time talking about my philosophy of practice and why I do certain things uh, in, in a consultation now because I can tell them that uh, I, I encourage them to read the book because it goes into more detail about my thought process and why we've chosen this particular uh, treatment plan for you or for your, your child. And my practice, by the way, is about 55, 56% adults and then the rest are adolescents and preteens. <clears throat> I do um, quite a bit of phase one treatment. Um, I do a lot of aligners. Uh, I'm a diamond provider with Invisalign. I have two printers in my office uh, and I'm doing in-house printing for uh, some of that. Uh, and I also use a, uh, the Henry Schein SLX clear aligners uh, as well. So uh, I use a lot of aligner therapy. And uh, just as a sort of a background as to how I, how I treat. Uh, so I would encourage everybody to write a book. I mean, heck, you can even get a book that's written by somebody else and they, you can pay them and, and they will, there are services that will allow you to put your name on it. But I would recommend writing it. And then trust. How do you establish trust? Well, this sounds really weird, but it's, it's an observation that I have uh, made over the years, and it's really, I think, proven out to be relatively uh, reliable, and that is your photography. Um, take pride in taking excellent photographs of your patients, intraorally and extraorally. Why is that important? This is, this is a picture of my photo room. Um, the reason is that it not only gives the impression that we're very detail oriented. I mean, it's clear that we take our photographs seriously when someone walks into this room, um, but they also know that we take the aesthetic result very seriously as well. And we're not afraid to examine our results. We're not afraid to blow it up and look at it very, very carefully. And I think that the impression that that gives to patients, whether they recognize they're getting that impression or not, leaves a sense of trust uh, in the skills of the practitioner. So I highly recommend it. Um, by the way, if uh, any of you are interested uh, in anything that you see in this presentation, um, feel free to, uh, to reach out. And uh, I'll, like, for example, that backlight, that LED backlight is great. It's being held up on the wall by uh, command strips. It's so light, it's a millimeter thick. Um, and it, uh, I have it wired so that when I turn the switch on, when you walk in the room, that turns on. And then you can see I've got the dedicated soft light box that's a slave flash. But it really makes these pictures impressive, and it makes a, it makes a difference. Um, every, every other opportunity that uh, <clears throat> companies have to sell to consumers they encourage an interaction. They encourage either, either visualizing it or kicking the tires or taking a test drive or touching an Apple uh, iPhone, whatever the case may be. And if they can't touch your work, which they really can't, they need to see your work. And even if they see it just in their own mouths, it's really, really important. Um, one case as an example, uh, a, a, a young female that came to my office after having been through orthodontic treatment, her father was very concerned that she'd had some, um, she wasn't finished. And uh, she, her concern was that uh, she looked older in her mind than, than, than when she started her orthodontic treatment. And she meant by many years. And, and here's the reason why. It turns out that the orthodontist had extracted four bicuspids in her maxillary arch. I had never seen anything like that. Those are her first molars touching her canines. And uh, that really impacted her mid face. And, uh, and so I created space. Uh, you can see that her bite was end on, but these are just examples of the photographs 
we use a contraster um, on every patient so that I can see the, the smile arc and uh, along with the contour of all of the teeth uh, and the gingiva, which is very important. Um, this is uh, after she had had space regained for one implant on either side, but when you compare the two, you can really get a feel for the impact, the negative impact those extractions had on her mid-face support. And she looks a lot younger on the right side, even though that is um, almost four years after the picture that was taken on the, or no, excuse me, two years after the picture that was taken on the, on the left-hand side. Um, four years after her initial treatment by the other orthodontist. But these photographs, the bright white background, the soft light on their face, uh, these really uh, make a, a wonderful opportunity for our practices to um, gain the trust of individuals in our communities. Um, so let's talk about uh, the the gift of uh, being authentic. And and the, what I what I tried to do in building my new office was sort of establish, uh, uh, and you'll see some photos in a minute of it, uh, try to establish my personality. I'm kind of a minimalist, um, and I certainly didn't want my office, and you can see it in the background there, but I didn't want my office to look like every other office, so uh, I removed all of the walls. Uh, there's no wall between my waiting room and the clinic. Uh, you can actually sit in the waiting room and touch the patient that's getting treatment. Um, uh, in the in the clinic uh, next to you uh, so I did some things that were a little bit uh, uh, unorthodox but it's all worked out wonderfully well for me um, it's interesting that when you ask uh, offices and and businesses about their customer service most of them feel that they give superior customer service they pride themselves on it Yet a stunning 8% of the, of the customers agree, according to a Bain & Company analysis of uh, customer behavior. That's pretty pathetic. Uh, no wonder uh, it's hard to get good service when the places that you patronize uh, think they're giving incredible service and they're terrible. Well, that sure is an opportunity for us to uh, really make an impression on these patients. And that's what we try to do, and I know all of you do that are on the phone call or you wouldn't be on the call. Um, this is just an entrance, my entrance into, into the, this is the waiting room essentially, and that's the front desk. Um, you can see the, uh, the first uh, room on your left with the glass is the only enclosed room in the office, which includes my office, it's not enclosed, uh, is the treatment coordinator's office so that we could close the door for financial discussions. Um, you can see an ICAP machine in the background there and then the row of chairs. And I wanted, uh, I wanted to have an unobstructed view. So I, I, I have lighting that's from the ceiling and laptops and it really gives a nice minimalistic feeling, um, an upscale boutique feel. Uh, and it really is a pleasure to work here and the patients love it. Uh, and that's just another peek. You can see into my, into my treatment coordinator's office, I just have a couch and a chair. I don't have a desk. I don't sit down at a desk when I walk in. I introduce myself as John and I sit either on the couch next to him or in the chair up against the wall and we just discuss their case. Um, I, everything that I do, I try to make it the opposite of their past experiences with physicians and dentists so that it sticks out in their mind and it really works well. And that's just a view from our clinic looking out, the view that I'm looking at right now as I'm speaking to you. Um, it's just gorgeous. Uh, and then you can sense that there's a very minimalistic feel in the, in the, in the practice. And uh, I like that. And every patient that is gonna have a long procedure has their hands dipped in paraffin and then their eyes are covered with a warm or a cool mask. Even dudes in man buns uh, put their hands in the uh, paraffin wax. And uh, there they are with the eye mask on, which is nice because the patients, almost all of them fall asleep because you've given them permission. Since their eyes are covered, nobody can tell if they're sleeping or not. Um, I want to share something with you that uh, I've been hesitant to share in the past, but uh, I'm, I'm happy to share it with you. And that's something that I do for all of my new patients that I bond. Uh, after whether they receive Invisalign or braces, about a week later, this arrives uh, at their house and it costs me about $40 a patient. 
And uh, I'm not going to say much more other than I've been doing it since I started here and I'll never not do it. Um, the word of mouth that gets out in your community that your orthodontist cares enough about you um, that right when your teeth hurt the worst, that's why we don't give it to them the day they get bonded, but a few days later, direct delivery from Amazon, they, you give them a blender, that's pretty nice. And it's something they're gonna use uh, for long after your treatment. And believe me, that they will talk about it. So it is definitely worth the, the cost of the, uh, of the blender. Well, let's talk about same day start since that's what this discussion is about. Um, in my office, what constitutes a same day start? Um, there are a lot of procedures that do. If I do an iTero scan uh, for clear aligners or um, for an appliance of any kind, uh, if I bond a motion appliance and then scan for the opposing arch retainer, uh, that is a same day start. Uh, we typically bond, initial bondings are five to five only. If they've got a very deep bite and I can't bond the lower brackets, I, I used to bond everything and put gigantic bite blocks. I just don't do that anymore. I just don't think it's kind. And so if it's, got a, if it's a patient with a deep bite, we only do an upper bonding and we only do it five to five. Well, think about how long that takes not very long. And uh, that's great because you can get, a, you can get that patient in. Uh, even if you've got a full schedule, you can find time. It's an upper and a lower bonding if they don't have a deep bite, but it's still only five to five. And then they return on their next visit to bond the remaining teeth. Main reason for doing the, the five to five is, uh, is to minimize emergencies and broken brackets uh, in the molar area. Uh, and then uh, bonding of phase one, either airway or functional. And those two are segregated because they're different in my practice with different treatment protocols. Uh, phase one airway typically have rapid palatal expanders, uh, whereas it just uh, an average phase one does not. So the patient psychology of a same day start is something that you've really got to etch into your mind and think about all of the things that they have done to say yes to you. I mean, they have researched you and found your office. For some reason, they've come to you. Um, they've reached out. They've made a phone call. They've calendared it. And they've made arrangements out of their schedule to come in and see you. And they've convinced themselves that they at least need someone to tell them whether or not they need ortho treatment or they're ready for it. So it isn't presumptuous uh, uh, at all for us to offer to start them that day. In fact, I think we could make a pretty good argument that it's rude to not start them that day. Because if we do start them on the day they come in, that's just being respectful for their time and their schedule. You've gotta be assumptive. And that is a hard thing for practitioners that are typically used to waiting for two or three visits before they do the bonding and they wanna make sure the patient's really ready and are they a financial risk and all of that. Uh, um, I, I promise you that there, there, there are fortunes to be made by being assumptive and starting these patients. Um, so let's talk about the staff psychology though. The staff psychology is important because they need to buy in to this idea of squeezing a new patient into the schedule for a start. They don't own your practice, so they don't think about it 24 seven like you do or like I do. They don't worry about it. They don't lose sleep over it like we do. And, and they don't revel in the, in the successes as much as we do. And so they need to be taught the psychology of the patient and the patient start that we just reviewed. They need to understand what it took for those patients to get into our office. And they need to have the attitude around the patients of why wouldn't they start today? The whole point of them being here is to commence with orthodontic treatment. And so the whole attitude in my office has changed from, if you wanna do this, or if you decide to move forward or whatever, to uh, we're doing it, right? So when you, when you get scanned, when you get your braces on, when you start orthodontic treatment, and the thing that we as, as practice owners need to do, and I think there may be some staff on this call as well, but we need to somehow impart the exhilaration of, of, of the same day start to our staff. And you need to decide how to do that for your office, whether it is by bonusing your, pay, your, your staff, somehow they need 
something beyond just a slap on the back. Hey, thanks for making us money. Uh, they, they really need to do that. I'll share with you what I do. Uh, for every same day start, at the end of the day, I have a little uh, velvet bag that has poker chips in it. The poker chips um, have, an, have uh, a dollar value assigned to them and there's a discrete number of each dollar amount in the bag and that, that bag is shaken up and each staff member, every single one of them, whether it's front desk or, or the clinical assistants, uh, they, they all reach in the bag and they pull out a poker chip and they get cash that day. Uh, based upon what the poker chip is. And one of them, there's one red poker chip that is a $50 bill. Sometimes you'll go on a streak where nobody has pulled out the red chip for months. I had one staff member that uh, three days in a row pulled out the $50, uh, you know, the $50 chip. Listen, whatever you've got to do to give your staff at least some reason to uh, accept the fact that they're going to have to squeeze a patient in. And I don't care if it's over lunch, if it's in between patients, they need to be able to do it. Um, that is, uh, that is the, the, the key in my, in my mind anyway, is that the staff has to be fully on board. And why are they so important? Well, this is the crux of the discussion tonight. Uh, the data that we have been able to glean from OrthoFi, real-time data of buying habits and sort of a peek into the psychology of purchasers of orthodontic treatment has really illuminated uh, the, the importance of the same day start. And what do I mean by that? Well, let's take a look at some of these key real-time stats uh, from, from real ortho orthodontic offices using OrthoFi. At the end of the presentation, I'm gonna share with you my numbers, my stats, so you'll see how much it's impacted my office. Because we're very now oriented, this is not terribly shocking, but I think it is illuminating. The conversion rate for same day start is 100%. That is a blinding flash of the obvious. However, same day contracts are not 100%. So the patient comes in, they're, they, they would love to get going. They actually sign the contract. The treatment coordinator has them do everything, inform consent, the whole nine yards. They've signed the contract. They just don't have time today. Well, not every one of those patients is actually going to become a patient. Now, that is a very small percentage, so I still feel good about a same day contract. Scheduled starts, patients that don't sign the contract, but they do put themselves on the schedule to start, two out of 10 are not gonna show up for whatever reason, whether they get home and something comes up and they, they realize they can't afford it or they go to another office, whatever the case may be. The most alarming ought to be, in your mind anyway, non-scheduled starts. Those that agree to treatment, they're on board, they, they wanna be with your office, uh, they're ready to go, but they need to go home and they need to discuss it with a spouse or whatever they've gotta do. Less than half of those patients actually start. These are real numbers. And we know these numbers um, inside and out. In fact, because of this now culture, we've got a real demand curve that diminishes to the point of a nader once you get out to uh, about three months out from their initial exam. In fact, the second they leave your office, they, you start eroding their conversion capacity. Adults fade faster. The adult is the red line. The child is the blue line. And you can see that within 45 days, there is a 75 to 80% drop in commitments for case acceptance. That is very, very startling. We have got to be on top of our recall. Uh, and when I mean recall, I don't mean observation patients. I mean those patients that walk out the door that did not put their name on the schedule for a start, yet they've committed. Because the chances are if we don't get them within the first 45 days, we have got a significant opportunity to never see them again. And that ought to be something that concerns everybody. Uh, and it's something that, that we've really focused on in my practice. Um, and so how do you create that culture in your office of the same day start? Well, key information that OrthoFi allows me to look at 
and almost, I feel like I cheat a little bit when I see this information, but it helps me so much. That's all on the part of Orthofy. Removing the patient obstacles by giving them the freedom to choose the schedule of payment that they, uh, that they feel comfortable with um, really makes a big impact. The last part is removing the obstacles of a same day start in your office. Um, that is all on you. And so those obstacles, whether they be scheduling obstacles, staff obstacles, treatment coordinator obstacles, it doesn't matter. Whatever that is, there should never be an opportunity in your practice that a patient would like to start the day they have the consult that gets turned down, no matter what. And if there is, and we actually had one last Friday, and it got to the point where we were so busy and we were running behind because of a patient that came in late for their consultation that my treatment coordinator at the end of the day came into my office and wasn't near tears, but was pretty upset because she said, I actually had to let a same day start go because I just knew we were going into the lunch hour. I just knew that we weren't going to be able to start them. Well, that ought to be exquisitely rare. And we talked about it in a meeting today about how to remedy that situation. You can't blame the staff and you can't blame your schedule for doing, for not doing same day starts. This is totally on the doctor. This is on the leader of the team as far as how are we gonna make these happen. There is no room for excuses. Gary V, which many, and he, many of you know who Gary V is, a quote from Gary V, the quickest way to tell someone is a loser is to hear them cast blame. Blaming is for losers. And uh, I just think that there isn't an excuse that you can come up with that I think is reasonable when it comes to turning down same day starts. The, the ease with which OrthoFi has created a, uh, uh, an ecosystem for these patients to onboard themselves to your practice makes it so simple to start these patients on the first day that you meet them. We have more than, um, we have more than 80% uh, of our patients. This is, when I say ours, I mean all of Orthofi's doctors in over 300 offices. Um, over 80% of them complete their forms, their intake forms, health history, insurance, uh, patient information, bef uh, early, before they come to your office. How extraordinary is that? Um, this reduces what we refer to as urgent checks, which means that a patient is in the office. And as most people know, one of the unique things that OrthoFi does is it does all of the insurance checks uh, for the practice so that you don't need an insurance coordinator. And an urgent check would simply mean that their, their insurance has not been verified, yet they're sitting in your office. And OrthoFi does a, they have an entire team that is dedicated to only urgent checks and they get a red flag and they know that the patient's in the office and all of their uh, efforts are focused on getting that patient taken care of within minutes of the, of the alert going out. Uh, and then 94% of checks delivered prior to the exam. Um, and those checks, meaning the checks with the insurance on the, on the part of the uh, OrthoFi, um, all of it is HIPAA compliant for these patients. Um, they can do it on mobile, they can do it on, on desktop, and it's required in our practice. I mean, we've been completely paperless for quite some time, as I imagine most of you are. Um, we don't have any papers. We don't sign paper contracts. We don't do, uh, there, is, there are no papers. Everything is scanned and shredded uh, if there is any kind of paper. Um, and so all of this is done online and we just tell them, look, we can't do the consult unless you finish all of this and you need to do it ahead of time. Um, they, they initiate the dental insurance answers. They talk about financing. Are they willing to let us do a, a soft credit check or not? Uh, and uh, uh, away we go. And here, in my opinion, is one of the most magical parts of OrthoFi that is sort of an unsung hero, in my opinion. This is a, just a group of eight questions that are asked of every patient uh, regarding their treatment and their concerns and their thoughts. And all of them are important. Uh, what, you know, what are the most important things to you? It's on a slider so that psychologically you can slide that over to how important it is in your mind. Um, the most important one to me is right there. How interested are you in starting orthodontic treatment within the next month? 
It's amazing how many patients filled out these eight questions and totally forgot that these questions were asked. And I know they forgot it because so many times uh, I've mentioned one of the question responses to them and they're like, how'd you know that? And uh, you know, you tell them, well, you filled it out on the OrthoFi information before you came to our office. Well, I'll tell you that question, question number eight is the ticket for me because if they have expressed extreme interest, and this is what it looks like to me, before I go into the consultation, my treatment coordinator comes out to me after having done all the initial records, we sit down in my office, formulate a treatment plan, and I'm looking at these things that are important to the patient. If I see that chart like you see it right now, interested in starting treatment with, within a month, that's important to them. Not only is it important, it's extremely important to them, well, I'll tell you, all concerns about being presumptive uh, go away from me, and I become assumptive. And so when I leave the room, I easily turn to my treatment coordinator and say, hey, listen, um, if, if Megan wants to start treatment right now, let's respect her schedule, and I can ask one of the staff members to do a scan. It's as simple as that. Hearing that out of the doctor's mouth is all the patient needs to hear to know that we'll squeeze them into the schedule. They're, we're clearly busy, they can see that, uh, and, uh, and they will, they will take, a, that, take that opportunity. These are the things that are the most important to patients um, based upon the last 18 months of data that we've collected in, from OrthoFi. The number one thing in every patient's mind, believe it or not, is the quality of treatment. Comfort comes number two. Uh, the tech and the monthly, the low monthly payments are tied and then clear, any kind of clear, whether it's a bracket or, or, a, or, or an aligner, is the lowest on that. Um, the thing that I love about OrthoFi is that it gives my team members the opportunity to do other things because they're not calling insurance companies. They don't do that. Uh, they don't call because somebody's got a late payment. All of that is taken care of for me, and I, I'll, that allows me to have them focus on other roles. Um, it is, I'm not gonna dive deep into it, but it is very sophisticated and very complex uh, as far as how OrthoFi is able to very quickly determine someone's coverage and benefits. They combine machine learning with actual uh, human input together to do verification and benefit calculation. Um, their target turnaround time is 30 minutes um, as far as uh, how quickly they're able to determine uh, whether a patient's got uh, uh, insurance benefits and if they're able to uh, cash in on those benefits. Um, and they also do automatic rechecks. It's very, very impressive. The, the flexibility gives these patients their the choice to choose their price. Um, I like the last line there, don't protect yourself from growth by being so cautious because you're worried about a patient's ability to pay uh, that, that you are losing opportunities for those patients. Um, remember we talked, remember that we talked about the importance of that 45 day window. If a patient leaves your office and they have not scheduled or they're not going to schedule, and they're gonna go home and speak with a spouse or whatever the case may be. It is so critical to follow those patients. Clearly, the numbers scream, mission critical, get them back before 45 days, or at least touch, reach out and touch them before 45 days. Um, one of the things that, that OrthoFi has continually improved upon is their pending management. And so uh, we always have a dashboard of patients. If you look up and it says follow up and there's a little 13 next to it on the top part of the menu bar in, in, in that screenshot, uh, those follow up patients all have to have a disposition or they stay on that follow up page. And the disposition is as easy as a drop down box that one of the staff members is able to click on and then, and then put them in the right category, but until that happens, they're sitting in the follow-up. And that's really important. Between needs attention and follow-up, those numbers, we keep them very low in our office. Um, those offices that are using the pending management 
have higher conversion rates. And it makes sense because of the data that we talked about and the 45 day mark importance. Uh, that's a lot of money that offices are missing out on if they're not critically watching these patients in, a, in some sort of a pending patient management uh, system. Uh, and so what does that do? Well, it gives, it gives us as orthodontists the opportunity for growth. And OrthoFi has always focused on growing patients, I mean, growing doctor's practices, not just making it easy for a patient because of a slider that they have. Um, it's, it's, it's important to understand that the, the benefit that I have, at least for me, um, is, uh, is reflected in the analytics that I get because the analytics that I have in my practice, as you've been able to sort of gather throughout the presentation, are not just strict numbers, they're behavior patterns. And those behavior patterns matter to me because that is a reflection of the mindset of the patients that walk in my door. Before I even meet them, I, I understand at least in part uh, the mindset of a particular patient and how to approach them for a same day start. It's really been impactful for our practice to do that. Um, and so one of the things that is critical to understand is that this, this entire process is all a part of the ecosystem of OrthoFi that the patients are in for growth of the practice to insurance eligibility, the billing and collections and the analytics. Now, how much does it really cost? People are always ask that. They're like, well, it's a percentage. You know, how much is it actually going to cost? So let's talk about it. Um, I really do love this quote, avoid tripping over dollars to pick up pennies. Orthodontists are pretty good at doing that. Uh, we are really focused on um, actual dollar amounts and we sometimes don't step back and look at the real value being brought to a practice. So here are some numbers for you. If you've got a patient, let's start with a, an average office that does about 300 starts or 350 starts, somewhere in that, in that frame. For a 300 start practice that has about one, one and a half million dollars in revenue, the estimated fee from OrthoFi is gonna be 2.8% of net production. And that's somewhere in the 44,000 to $48,000 range. Is that a lot of money? Yeah, of course it is, however, the benefit, uh, the return on investment from that is significant, way more significant than if I didn't use that service. Not to mention the fact that I don't have a financial coordinator. I'm not doing it, I'm not paying someone to do all of that for me. The return on investment uh, in the OrthoFi average across all of the practices that are in that um, size range is about 2.1x uh, return on investment. If it's a moderate sized practice, let's say they're around 600 starts, then that return on investment is about 2.5X. So you can see the numbers going up, the annual investment goes up obviously, um, because you're reflecting a percentage of net production. Um, but important to note is the year over year net income growth. And how is that impacted by all of these systems being in place in your office? Um, I'll show you mine in just a second. And so if you've got a large practice that's doing over $5 million in revenue with a thousand plus starts a year, then the fees are gonna be around 110 to $115,000 uh, because it's reflected as, as a percentage of the, of the net production. And uh, so you have to look at the real, the, 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 the growth of those practices and how they're impacted. The return on investment um, on average for those large practices is 3x. That's huge. That is really impactful. Um, before we wrap up, because our hour is drawing nigh and I want to leave some room for some questions, I'm going to share with you my numbers. And these are my actual practice numbers uh, that I will share with you. Um, I started using OrthoFi in uh, the first quarter of 2014, um, and this is on 12 doctor days a month. And this is uh, in 2014, I was still flying back and forth to Arizona 
um, uh, while I was growing this practice. So my annual production in 2014, I had 89 starts. Um, and uh, that was re reflected, and these are real numbers. The, the, the dollar amounts, the real number too, $402,000 production. In 2018, I, I had 323 starts on the same number of days, three doctor days a month, which was about 1.6 million in production. Um, the total production growth rate, if you look at just the rate of growth, it was almost 300% growth rate. Is that all ortho five? No, of course not. <clears throat> but does it have to do with the culture of doing a same day start and delivering excellence and using the five irrefutable principles of selling? Yes, absolutely it does. Um, if you'd look at it as a compounded annual growth rate, just looking at the average then over those years, that's a 41% growth rate um, averaged out as a compounded rate. Uh, so the total service fees that were paid over that, over that time period are 108,000. The total net profit though, over those years was 2.4 million. Um, it's, it is absolutely important in my mind to not trip over those dollar bills to save pennies when you start focusing on service fees that we end up paying anyway, but we pay it in different ways. And so for me, it's really, it's really important to focus on that. And if you wanna average those service fees paid over the four years, then it's $27,000 a year. An average incremental net profit per year was about half, a little over half a million dollars. Um, with the exception of two quarters, maybe three quarters, I haven't had a quarter uh, since I have started my practice in Salt Lake City that hasn't had growth. And uh, it's due to a lot of factors, but certainly OrthoFi has been a big part of that, <clears throat> as well as changing the culture in the office uh, to a culture of, uh, of starts uh, as soon as the patient is willing to start, which is usually the day that they come in the office. So that's all I've got for everybody. Um, I appreciate you spending the time. I'm starting to lose my voice. So I think we've timed this just right. Um, there is a contact uh, uh, text that you can text uh, using your phone um, and uh, reach out to Ortho5 if you have questions about that. And now for about five to seven minutes, I'm happy if anybody has any questions. Um, then I'm happy to entertain those. I think I've got a couple of uh, folks here. Uh, one of the questions um, from Barry, hi Barry, uh, how do I handle interdisciplinary patients? Um, great question. And uh, I'm, I have a lot of them because I have a majority adult practice that I love, by the way, I just love it. I have excellent working relationships with a lot of specialists. Uh, surgeons, uh, aesthetic dentists, um, prosthodontists, and I reach out to them a lot. Um, I, I speak with them a lot. And also I have airway patients. I don't do adult airway treatment with um, adult airway appliances. Uh, I focus on kids and airway, and that's topic for another discussion. But I reach out a lot to ear, nose, and throat specialists and pediatricians um, and uh, I, I, I am very visible in the medical community uh, when it comes to pediatric airway. In fact, I will be doing a grand rounds for the large pediatric children's hospital that we have here for all of the physicians talking about um, early interceptive treatment with a combination ortho surgery for kids as they're developing. Um, but uh, that is a unique thing that happens when you have a, a lot of adult patients. Um, because I do a lot of aligners and I do Invisalign for all of the, uh, the cases that are essentially more than 20 trays, um, uh, I, I have really honed my skills as far as utilizing uh, Invisalign to set up those patients and then also sharing those cases with other doctors. I have an ICAP machine and so I use the um, the uh, software that to read the the CT scans, the uh, Anatomage software now has an option to share those files 
uh, directly with doctors. That has, be, that has been one of the most impactful things in my practice, I'll be honest with you, because we're just sending them an email and they have a browser-based uh, ability to see the scans that I send them. So I don't burn scans on CDs anymore or anything like that. I just send them a link and they've got it and then I'm notified when they open it. So um, that, that's, a, that's a great question, but it's really, an, it's, it's a critical one for my, for my practice. Let me uh, see about another question here. Hold on a second. Yeah, let's see if we've got any other questions. If anybody has a question, feel free. And if not, then uh, and it's going to be a wrap. I'll wait one second here. I'm. It's taking me some time because I don't see my mouse. So it's, um, here we go. How are the finances handled with the same day start? Um, and uh, is the uh, initial IP, I'm assuming initial IP is the initial payment collected or is this planned for the following appointment? Um, well, the finances are handled um, because the patients are choosing their own down payment uh, with the slider uh, as well as choosing their monthly payment. Um, those patients, um, we don't, we don't, you know, we don't do any statements or anything like that. Everything they, they have to have a credit card on file with us. So most of them are either credit card or uh, some in cash. Uh, they write a check to us. So it hasn't been an issue for our practice with the same day start. Um, and it's a very valid point. You know, do they do they walk in your office with a bunch of money that they could do with a down? Well, keep in mind that with the flexibility uh, that that we give our patients, uh, the down payment can be as low as two hundred and fifty dollars, even on Invisalign patients. Um, many practices try to protect themselves. Uh, from loss of their investment with the lab fee by charging a patient a down payment that's higher than normal if they're going to do Invisalign to cover that. And again, I think that you fall into the trap of you're protecting yourself out of profits because mm, the, the delinquency uh, factor in my practice is almost non-existent. Um, I think we've got maybe, well, we have less than 1% uh, delinquency beyond 90 days. Um, patients pay. And you know, the interesting thing that we found from OrthoFi data is that those that become, those that are not going to pay, declare themselves within the first six months of treatment. It isn't people that are at the 23rd month of treatment and they haven't been in braces for, you know, eight months. Those people still pay. It's the individuals in the first six months of treatment that realize they bit off more than they could chew financially. So they declare themselves very early, which was a surprising finding for, for us when we started looking at the numbers as far as those patients that um, ended up defaulting on their, on their payments. Um, another question from Tom. Tom, hey Tom, how are you buddy? Um, when you converted to using OrthoFi, how does OrthoFi handle the current patient contracts? Well, that is a great question and I am not equipped to answer that because Tom, I, uh, enabled OrthoFi in, in patients that were in a new practice here in Salt Lake. We did have uh, some patients that uh, had already started that we just manually uh, migrated over to OrthoFi, but it wasn't a lot. You saw the numbers. The numbers started off pretty low, so uh, it wasn't a hard thing to do. For a very large practice, I would encourage you to reach out to OrthoFi. They have onboarding teams, and that's all they do. And so they have systems in place to do that for sure. Uh, I'm, I just am not the one to, uh, to speak to it. Um, do we have a recording of the webinar? Yeah, this is being recorded as far as I know. Um, do you offer third-party financing options like LendingPoint that did not? Yes. Um, well, Care Credit, LendingPoint, we don't do LendingPoint. We have Care Credit. We might do LendingPoint. Um, but uh, uh, Care Credit is probably the only one that uh, currently that we offer. But I think that's a great idea. I think that you ought to uh, engage a company that will allow no down payments. Although if you keep your down payments low, it's not a problem. Um, uh, Nicole, OrthoFi is working on integration uh, to take over accounts receivable um, and taking over accounts receivable. 
I don't know if that's a question or not. Um, there is the, the recording will be on the NISO uh, website by the end of the, of the week. Um, what are your, Brian asks, what are your team members focused on now that OrthoFi is performing a lot of the services normally done in the office? That's a great question. Those, those staff members are repurposed for things that are far more important to me than the mundane tracking phone calls of insurance companies. They are uh, enhancing the patient experience in my office, whether they are uh, posting on social media or they are um, maintaining the, the relationships that we have with our referring doctors. Uh, every team member, uh, believe me, they are busy. And for those offices that have financial coordinators that are worried that they're going to, or staff members that may be on the call, um, OrthoFi, um, while it does take the place of the main duties of the financial coordinator, those financial coordinators are gifted individuals and they surely have the skills uh, necessary to do other roles in the office that would allow an office to thrive uh, by utilizing them in, in, a, in a different way. I think it's a great question. All right, well, it's six o'clock, everybody. I think that that's probably gonna be a wrap. I appreciate everybody's time. Uh, and uh, it's been a real pleasure. I'm sorry my voice started giving out. If you have any comments, uh, you are welcome to reach out to me personally. Um, and uh, if not, then reach out to either the NISO website for the recording of this uh, webinar uh, or uh, reach out to OrthoFi. Uh, it's been a pleasure. I appreciate everybody's time here.